Arratxaldeon guzti guzti hoi eta azteko eta behin izan zaitezke te noski ongi etorri. Beste behin badakezue ude berria el. Welcome to a new edition of Gutun Surya. We meet again on our yearly meeting. So we're back uh, to doing this event uh, live. The uh, festival will uh, go up until April the 2nd. And the title of this edition is Lost and Found in Translation. She now repeats in Spanish, so uh, she was speaking in Basque uh, previously, so welcome. You know, this is a very important event in our uh, program, especially to get to know uh, different uh, artists, creators, and to share with them, to talk with them about their expectations. And now she talks in English. The authentic pleasure that it is for us to come here, to meet you here again. Welcome to all of you. Gutun zuria dakizuen bezala, noski presentziala da eta placer izugarria. We're doing this event live again and it is a pleasure for us to have you all here in the theater, but also we keep on doing the online version and uh, we pay attention to this uh, world that is constantly being translated. We translate experiences, we uh, translate uh, genders, uh, languages, and uh, territories, identities, bodies. So, all these different subjects is uh, what we're going to be dwelling on uh, during this uh, year. So, this is a way uh, to be in the world, uh, this translation. So, we have to translate uh, what we say so we all understand each other in this uh, world. We have a very full uh, agenda and today we're going to hold the first uh, dialogue. In the morning there uh, will be some uh, presentations we will also present uh, DVDs and uh, comics, uh, and there will be also a session at the uh, library in the afternoon. I also wanted to mention that there is the atrium, what we call the AZ space, uh, where we can all meet and uh, share. So more than 30 different uh, proposals, talks, uh, uh, to talk about the link in between different cultures and sensitivities, uh, and also to, well, get to know the limits of the literature genders and get to know the limits of uh, translation and uh, writing. So more than half, uh, more than 50, uh, different uh, writers and authors will be uh, here with us, like Giodori Califatis, Kirman Uribe, Miabe, Santiago Soron, men, and many others. So they're all really uh, high class uh, artists, and it is a pleasure to welcome them all here in this uh, festival. Up and contrast their thoughts and also with the communities of publics in the form of conferences, roundtables, and debates. Denetarik izango dugu, ez da forma asko ematen dizkiogulako gure jardunari. Una programación que arranca todas las mañanas, arrancamos hoy. And every morning, we will see new ways uh, to do narrative. We will also present a new books because we also have in work in cooperation with uh, bookshops. And at the atrium, uh, we will be holding different uh, shows. Uh, so without any further ado, because we have a very busy agenda, I would just like to say that once again, we're very happy to host you here in this uh, theater. So as I've said uh, previously, 
we have the public space is like the public square the az uh, atrium that is very dynamic uh, very much alive where music radio and poetry will be very much uh, present there we will see the different proposals creative proposals of our authors uh, in a very dynamic and alive way. We will explore different uh, languages and uh, formats because those are the uh, basic grounds of today's activity. And uh, to conclude, as I've said, uh, we already have some activities happening in uh, the library. So we we'll start today and it will be going up until April the 2nd with a huge variety of activities and events. And they will all turn around the idea of everything is about translation and about our title called Lost and Found in Translation. So you are also going to be part of this um, event. So here we have now coming to the stage Santiago Seron. Talking with Iñaki. Well, thank you very much for attending once again Gutun Surya. Before we start talking uh, to Santiago, we would like to send a big, big hug uh, to Martina Yagubenko. She was here last year. She came from Ukraine uh, when she was very young and uh, her family has been living in Mariupol until very recently. This uh, morning she sent a last message saying what a pity and with a picture uh, showing like it was like a sky picture of the city and it was fully devastated. Si me hay un técnico, que suban por favor el volumen. Tenemos a el gran privilegio ¿no? de tener con nosotros a Santiago Auxerón, eh, como sabéis todos, fundador de Radio Futura, con una carrera, gran carrera en solitario como Juan Perro, cantante, compositor, guitarrista, investigador de las raíces negras. We have Santiago Auxerón. He is a singer, songwriter, and he also holds a PhD in philosophy. He had his own group, uh, uh, Radio Futura, and then also um, he... Uh, also went uh, then playing uh, solo uh, as uh, Juan Perro. He just uh, published uh, uh, Sound Art, and with him we traveled to the ancient uh, Greece. Uh, we are going to try to define this kind of art, that is the art of muses, of uh, words, maybe about songs also. So these uh, uh, is the sound art that he uh, discovered when he was very uh, young and this was uh, when he attended the uh, Golden Cinema in Zaragoza. Well, good afternoon or evening. Here I've experienced uh, fraternity, friendship, and very, very intense uh, uh, moments. So it was a pleasure to me to come back here and to feel again my heart sort of uh, uh, flooded with uh, you and with this uh, city. So from this uh, magnificent uh, festival, Gutun Surya, I am very glad to work again with uh, Iñaki because he is a highly sophisticated culture man to share ideas that are not always easy to share because uh, this book uh, that I've uh, just presented took me like uh, 25 years to be fully finished
I've been writing it as I was learning to be a musician. And uh, you've been mentioned also some anecdotes uh, of a book, uh, Lost Rhythm, Ritmo Perdido, uh, published by Anagrama. And in the initial chapter, I would describe the top moments when I was a child and then I began uh, being uh, really interested uh, by sound. My grandmother So my grandmother, she would work at the uh, cinema in uh, Saragossa. So she would take me with her. She would take me through the back door before she would go and uh, work there herself. She would uh, go there, get there, get changed. She would be wearing a uniform. And then there was this little like uh, room where she would get changed. She would take me to the end uh, line and, and uh, sitting row in the cinema. And since I was like three or five years old, I would uh, watch all these uh, movies that were not meant for a kid. But I love them. And it is true that this sound amplified in darkness to me became like a mental environment that became part of me, but not everything was about music in this amplified sound. My sensitivity when I was a naive boy was very much impressed by these amplified dialogues. There was also lots of shooting and also some uh, excessive music uh, when they were about to kiss. I was especially impressed by those interval in between the shootings uh, against different uh, gangs. There were these people singing the Mexican songs, rancheras. And then I would try to reproduce that at home with a little guitar that my uh, parents uh, gave me. And all I was uh, doing was uh, making noise and reproduce these uh, screams by uh, Mexican singers unless I was told not to do that anymore. So this kind of uh, sound excitation that was like prehistoric then got a shape, turned into something else. And also it was related to this darkness in these um, children's um, bedroom and then in my new home when my father no longer was working as a topographer. Uh, he would work as a topographer uh, when they were building the uh, American um, camps or bases. And then instead of working as a, a topographer, he got another job and uh, he were not, we were not longer living in a very modest uh, home because in the downtown Sargossa it was like uh, houses were very simple, modest, and we moved to the outskirts and the house was a bit better. That was also, you know, related uh, with the parties my uh, parents would hold at, ha at home. I would listen to swing music, jazz music, and children, we would uh, listen to that from the darkness of our bedrooms. So we could no longer see images, but uh, only hear the sound and then make ourselves the images. So this, then this took me to uh, next stage when I was initiating myself in the sound, I would listen to lots of uh, Duke Ellington's Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole, uh, jazz music and blues. But we knew, we children knew that on the radio, there were new hippie singers in London imitating the Mississippi and Chicago singers. And in some uh, machines, uh, music machines in um, 
Saragossa, we could already listen to this kind of a music. It was a weird, really, um, initiation into sound. Because usually when you are a kid, you have this empire of images uh, made by big companies and also these sort of military images here in the Iberian Peninsula at the time. So this was like a mental alienation to me. This is how I got into music. And we had this uh, culture derived uh, from the Marshall Plan of the uh, post-war uh, period. But personally, I wanted to do more than describing uh, the geopolitics. That is more to know why generation of Spanish uh, kids, we uh, wanted to get to know the uh, foreign music. So as I was learning music and uh, this uh, profession of mine, I realized that there was something else that, than this uh, imperialist uh, dependence. Uh, there was also a kind of participation of the uh, Iberian Peninsula or the different cultures of the Iberian Peninsula in the process of uh, sharing feelings with other ethnic uh, groups in the New World with these uh, come and go of uh, the sound waves in between the new and the old uh, continent or world. And we realized that we rock players, we were not only uh, uh, ch children that were being diverted by the imperialist uh, propaganda, but also our awareness was being raised to uh, really be part of uh, a multi-ethnical um, music. So before we get to that point, uh, says Iñaki, and talking about your parents, I guess they would have uh, rather like you to be an engineer, but something happened to you. We were a large family, even though due to destiny, we are not such a large family nowadays, but we were a large family, always a very happy people on the brink of poverty, but highly musical and very dynamic and fun. So I was aware that it was so difficult to make and to meet. I started working very young, when I was very young, when I was only 15, and I was uh, like uh, an apprentice of uh, designing. And uh, that is where my father used to work. So I went there and started working, designing as an apprentice. So this was a village uh, nearby the Portugal border. And I got a train after the fourth year of high school with a local teacher, but then the teacher said, you know, I only got this far myself, so now you have to do it on your own. So I finished high school on my own. I would go and take exams. I would study on my own and then go and take exams in Huelva as I was working as a designer or a beginner designer. So I was already having this idea of creating a music band and imitating the soul music players because we had like a common um, philosophy. So they were very lenient in my company because they realized it was very busy and whenever there was not a heavy load of uh, work. Then they would let me open my books and study, even if I was uh, at the workplace. So it was okay if I took out my philosophy book. And then I got very much, uh, I got to very, very keen on philosophy. And I decided, okay, I can study here. And to me, this book of philosophy, my high school philosophy book, was like, uh, uh, serendipity moment because I went like boom I can think like as if I am in a cloud I could see reality from a cloud from up above 
And I used to feel that it was very, I mean, it was very, a very nice feeling to me because I was, that would take me a bit like away from a day to day reality. And then I was sort of diving into this uh, philosophy and in this book they were talking about weird things and I could not understand a word. And then I realized you maybe have to make things up yourself. And this is why I like philosophical literature or other kind of literature where there is this kind of uh, provocation where you don't really have to understand everything from the beginning. So that is like the challenge to me. I have to sort of make a part of it up uh, to kind of work, co-work with the author and the writer. To me, not understanding anything is something that is a uh, common business. And uh, I still practice that. So Aristotle's would say, well, the individual, the, I mean, people are made of matter, then substantial uh, f flesh, form, and uh, matter. Okay, so this is a shape and uh, matter. So it is. It was very peculiar to me that I have to analyze these things that are made of uh, the uh, basic matter, and then it turns into something else that has a shape. So what is it like? What is out of the edge of it? Uh, do short-sighted people see things in the same way? Is uh, substantial matter the same when you're short-sighted, short, short, uh, or you know? You know, when you see things like a bit blur, uh, I, I like it. I am very much attracted by, by it when you are short sighted, you know. But then things turn around. And uh, I began saying space and time are shapes of sensitivity, are a priori uh, shapes. So maybe. The subject has something, I mean, the subject individual is a condition how you understand the space, because the space a priori is already conditioned, and time is something that is internal to your sensitivity. So I would read this and say, well, this is fascinating. I understand nothing, but I like it more and more. So that really was driving me nuts. And I was sort of uh, really feeling really, really much attracted by that uh, turmoil of new things. So in the light of this idea that the individual could be responsible of the constitution of the space-time constitution of uh, the reality, well, I didn't then, then um, desire to become a, a civil engineer. But that was like nothing compared to all of that. So when I said I wanted to study philosophy, that led to some argument at home. Because in my company, they said we would pay for the engineering uh, degree if he wants to do that, because he wanted, uh, to, he, they wanted to keep me in the company, but I had my own plans. Well, so this is how we get this book that is the uh, Arte Sonora. So we're moving back uh, some centuries, traveling back in time. So we go back to classic uh, Greece, and uh, Santiago says and explains music would be an omnipresent uh, activity. So by singing, they would sort of share the common uh, memory. It was also part of the occasion together with gymnastics. And it was also about teaching values through the heroes, that is epic, through epic. And also about the punishment and the awards of the gods. As you know, they were all the time fighting gods at the time. Is this the starting point of your book? Well, when I got to Madrid and I began studying philosophy, I was very happy and I enrolled at the nighttime school and then 
I would go there after my uh, work and I really liked it and it was really intensive uh, to me. I was really passionate about studying uh, philosophy. So there, there were many reds and but also there were many uh, sisters and uh, fathers I mean, many religious people also attending the, this philosophy school. And this is when I got sort of hooked on this naturalist uh, um, thinkers that were the first philosophers in history. So these uh, pre-Socratic uh, thinkers were a big thing uh, for me, and this belief turned into a desire to dive deeper into this uh, subject matter. Then when I began uh, doing music, this is when I took up this challenge to turn into a modern singer, and I said, well, this is going to be what is going to uh, make me reflect because I am a vocational thinker, but what am I going to think about? So it was good for me to know about these uh, Ionian uh, philosophers. So the conflicts of the uh, industrial music that were quite uh, hard at the time gave me lots of material to think uh, about uh, overnight. Uh, this is why I got used uh, not to sleep at night. So my colleagues uh, in the band would uh, see me uh, arrive to our van with that uh, book, a thick book of uh, uh, philosophy, and they would laugh at me. So then sometimes when we were traveling, I would be a done reading about uh, metaphysics. So I got used to insomnia and I kept using philosophy uh, for my band and I realized little by little that uh, these old Greeks were good for me because I learned uh, from them and I would repeat uh, uh, what the poets would say. But I realized that learning these uh, first uh, verses, these first uh, lines in Greek, that could be a good school to me to rethink uh, on how to write lines uh, uh, for my lyrics. So I wanted to study uh, this uh, Greek uh, poetry. I wanted to know about the roots of our languages, about some uh, of our languages, because the Basque language, I know it's different. It is something that is uh, really uh, different, and it is really intriguing to know where it comes from. But on the one hand, it was about uh, getting to know these uh, uh, different uh, rhythms from the uh, black people that were taken to the new world, so to say. And then in my ha head, I had all of these, and then I have to think about these all. So I began uh, rereading uh, ancient uh, lyrics uh, and uh, the philosophers. and poetry, and also in 1977 I met some uh, poets in uh, Paris, then I finished my school in Madrid at the public university, and then by 1979 uh, I started with my band, and then my uh, uh, life took a new direction. But I was always studying philosophy, and when I decided that to put an end to the band, because I didn't want the lifestyle that the in music industry was taking me into. Then there was this kind of, uh, you know, with uh, Juan Perro, that is uh, John the dog, is as if I wanted to bark at the music industry. And this led me to some inconvenience, because I thought maybe if I'm only making half the money, but half uh, 
half the uh, leisure time to study more philosophy? No, this doesn't work. Uh, the uh, business uh, doesn't like you dropping a brand that is already very well known, especially if now you come with a new brand or a new name that comes with uh, something that like a barking with uh, Juan Perro, with John the dog. But this was an interesting uh, philosophical uh, teaching to me. I learned a lot. And little by little, at the same way as I was doing Juan Perro, I realized that my first thesis that I wrote in uh, uh, Paris was about Antoine Artaud, the crazy poet. And uh, he was a weird man. And then I dropped this. And in the 90s, I rewrote a thesis uh, at my university, and then they said, no, I mean, you are done with your studies. You have to write first all uh, your uh, thesis and then take the PhD courses. So then is when I did a PhD on the music in the old uh, Greece. And I've really made good use of all my time when I would go to Madrid, I would go to the National Library in Paris, I would go to the uh, Biblioteca Nationale, and uh, I would go also in Rome or in some other cities and try to photocopy something that I could not find here. So I had the privilege to or be able to uh, continuously do my research, even though there were some painful moments in order to keep a clear mind to do this. But you don't really need to have a clear mind uh, all the time. That is evident, according to my experience. I think you have to be able to reorganize the experience and be humble enough uh, you don't have to be the most clever person in the world to develop a philosophy. You have to give way to reflection and let muses, and well, this is tricky, let muses visit you. So you organize different ideas uh, cautiously uh, so that all these messes you have in your mind a sort of... Uh, get sorted out little by little. So to me, what was very important is that I realized that the, in the ancient Greece, the role music plays was a different one that, that one that we've been told about. So we, I started reading the uh, work by some uh, Hellenian act, uh, uh, philosophers like Homer, so the epic and the uh, poetry, So I realized that all this ancient uh, Greek uh, writings uh, were not really telling us about the important uh, role that the music was playing at the time. I think uh, this is uh, due to the influence of the second orality, that this is what we got through cinema, through phonographic uh, recordings, through radio. So in... In the 20th century, there is a new awareness about this need of sound and about the role uh, the sound plays in the way you elaborate your thinking. So I started uh, suspecting that if they realized, if they acknowledge that music played a major role in ancient Greek, and as Plato say in the Republic, I mean, to be a wise uh, citizen in the Sparta or in any other ancient uh, Ionian uh, city or in Sicily. So citizens had to be able to dance and sing uh, while holding each other's uh, wrist and be able to dance because this was a way uh, to be part of the city according to the greek uh, aristoc aristocratic uh, training or education 
and uh, at the time there was uh, the master in sitar so the teachers at the time well the scyther uh, players or masters and uh, with these uh, we get to the teaching of the practices of uh, the remote uh, past so to believe in heroes in gods to follow the example of uh, heroes of, of recent uh, past experiences so we're also maybe making this ideal uh, world run parallel to reality and as some, author, as some authors say, in ancient times, this uh, ideal world that we see in the uh, poetry of uh, the philosophers like uh, Homer was an important one. And there, the role played by music was foundational. So in the old uh, ancient uh, cities, in the uh, training, in the education, before the gramastistes, uh, the language or the literature uh, teacher uh, would be replaced by these uh, scyther uh, masters, they would uh, they uh, would uh, train uh, these uh, high-class uh, people uh, so they could uh, sing and dance and also to be polite, good manners, and so on. So these uh, musicians were like the teachers of the culture. And then when the ancient Greeks imported Phoenician uh, alphabet, I think it was on the 8th or 7th uh, uh, BC uh, century, then it was acknowledged that it was this Phoenician alphabet that made possible to write the distinctive uh, traits of uh, phonemes, so of what we uh, say when we talk. Uh, So thanks to this uh, writing, we could, uh, well, let's see the different phonemes. So music and muse, I think, share excellency. I think this idea in uh, ancient uh, Greece, this idea of excellence, uh, was very important for reasoning because arete, that is excellence, and this is something that is really notorious, the eminent, the excellent, something that is worth uh, remembering. Well, this arete shapes the frame for logos. Logos, uh, in the beginning, used to mean to collect. So, like uh, when you collect, you collect, so you pick things, like you harvest things. But then it was also an equivalent uh, to Mrs. In the beginning, Mrs. and Logos was n were not uh, like uh, in opposition. In the beginning, it seems they want to use uh, uh, these words as synonyms. But then they take different ways. So Mythos starts telling stories that are not fully credible. And then Muses move in a very gracious way. And the Logos is the language of those that write, that provide trustworthy testimonies of the past. And then they turn into the permanent testimony. So mythos in this process of differentiation of mythos and logos logos starts wanting to say to say because it's a saying like mythos but little by little then it turns into an explicative uh, uh, way of saying it gives the cause or the principles of things and ends when mathematics starts explaining the laws of nature, then it stops being 
reason in a mathematic way about proportion. I mean, this is like uh, the music. Uh, music ends up being like a mathematic paradigm. And now reason, reason is technica, something that was uh, studied by Heidegger. And it ends being numeric uh, reason that reconstitutes images by means of electronic support and by means of a computing system that combines ones and zeros in a series. And you, that makes you be able to reproduce image or sound. So this process from the myth of uh, the mythos, the myth of muses, then there was this choir of muses that was the original uh, um, myth of uh, the muses, and then you have this excellence that is equal up until the way that then by means of writing, then the words become more powerful and are the ones that then represent things and they become the owners of how to represent things. And then this leads us to something that men's, meant merchandise. So this took us into a technified trap. And this is when you have to realize how the old reason was, reali was related to the uh, muses. Yes, in your book, we see how we move from this uh, central place that was occupied by music, how then this diverts into writing. It seems that something is lost on the way. Some of the experience that was uh, that used to flow more, used to be more diverse, that was more promiscuous from a conceptual point of view, turns into something more stipulated, more legal, more strict. I would advise you to be strategically uh, cautious because we don't have to think of a golden age that is sort of just like um, flowing away. I think human beings are now the owners of natural spaces. We are now, uh, well, assisting to a war, a war. We thought it was no longer necessary to fight for a territory, but reality comes uh, to wake us, wake us, wake up us. And now there is this fight for this energy of the individual thinking. We have this battle of our spirits. Well, I don't like this word, spirit, because it might mean something really vague. But I would say this is the fight of the spirit. And that is what human beings are fighting for now, apart from this fight for a territory. And this is essential also for the future of this species. And I think that is of paramount importance for our future. I think in the process, something gets uh, lost uh, when Logos is technified since uh, the use of writing is externalized and now it is uh, nowadays it is uh, technified so we depend on electronic uh, devices that uh, manipulate image and sound so something gets lost does something get lost well we are running that risk and also we are running the risk of uh, of transferring something. And this is so as long as the power every human being has and is configured in a particular and specific non-repeatable way, if we see the plasticity acknowledged by neurology so that until the last uh, really um, breath of life it works but if we
transfer these two powers that tend to uh, technify the experience in order to concentrate in few uh, hands uh, uh, wealth so in order for them to control people and uh, the human beings then if we seed here then we are going to be dehumanized but it depends on us if we don't give in then writing might turn into a gun into a weapon instead of a prison instead of a sacred uh, uh, dogma because of course it's been dogmatized the use of a writing because in the beginning of the western world what was really holy or sacred was uh, the choir of the muses and then we had a polo that might be using the uh, arrows or maybe uh, playing some uh, uh, music so these uh, sort of unbalance or constant fight in between love and uh, fighting or arguments it's been always there this is really the the mesh of the ancient epic of a homer text epic poetry and then we have this uh, musical poetry that allows for the philosophy speech or discourse to now be articulated in uh, basic units that are fundamental so we're traveling back in time okay from here towards the past if we pay attention to see how images are manipulated, how writing is uh, turned into something holy, like the Holy Bible or the Quran. If we uh, talk about the technification of the alphabet uh, in, to counterbalance the technification, there's also about uh, the courts of, uh, uh, of a lira or the double holes of a flute that were the main instruments played in ancient Greeks, Greece. So if we try to understand all those techniques uh, in the same uh, process to understand the Western uh, thinking, there's not much of a loss. But if we just abandon ourselves to reality shows and to silly digital messages and we have no other communication uh, activity then we lose our humanity that's for sure of course but i'm not pro nostalgia of the lost world of a better uh, time this is i think too romantic and this does not allow, allow us to fight to uh, try to recover our main tools for dignity, music and words. So the sound and the lyrics, uh, and these are combined in songs uh, because, you know, songs are made of music and lyrics, and that is like the magic combo. And that makes us human, not our uh, PCs, talent shows, reality shows, or uh, cell phones. This uh, poetry goes much deeper than any digital download. Even if we say we have to now have new music uh, ways that sort of try to electrify children with this very simple cell of music, that technology is interesting, but it is very repetitive. We, you have to study reggaeton in order to understand what is happening. But if we give in, if we consider that these supports are what really, you know, what we have inside our jackets, I have my cell here in the inner pocket of my jacket, then if we only do that and give in to these devices, we've lost the battle about being humans. But if we follow this process and we do not lose the thread from the very beginning, and we compare the 
origin to the end. And uh, we sort of uh, hold the tension as if you were holding two electricity wires and there is a discharge on you and you're holding on. This is like traveling in the van of my band and this is like doing that with a book, uh, uh, your um, poetry, Greek uh, poetry book and uh, to hold your hangover by holding to your book. Well, the 20th century says in Yaki, it is true that sound uh, art uh, occupies again I would say a privileged uh, place like in classic uh, uh, Greece or ancient uh, Greece. But I think the world of uh, songs and these uh, blues and black uh, roots like uh, the dates back from the uh, 20s all the way up to rock music, I think uh, rock music has had a big influence. Uh, also, like in ancient uh, Greece, uh, it also shares or puts uh, through uh, values. It educates people. Well, it depends on what you do, says uh, Santiago Seron. Well, part of my generation sort of got lost in the uh, uh, toilets of uh, the uh, nightclubs. But if you survive to that, then you can think of you like something else and be very creative. Yes, but it shapes, uh, that has been shapes you. Am I right, says Sinyaki? Yes, this was a quantum leap that is important to link this uh, sound art that we've been really uh, been uh, summarizing uh, a lot. But talking also about the other book that talks about the influence of Black Africa into this Spanish uh, music uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula, I would say that independently from the issue of languages, the co-official languages that we have in Spain have four official uh, languages. And about the mystery of uh, three of them coming from Indo-European uh, languages through the evolution of Latin. And then we had another one, a fourth one, that is a Basque language. We don't know where it comes from exactly. That is still a mystery. There are different theories about it very much argued, uh, some of them. So we have this uh, uh, mystery that is uh, really a uh, treasure. So apart from the issue of languages in the Iberian Peninsula, I think there is like a community of exchange of rhythms that has an impact on every language, also to the traditional Basque language. And there are some rhythms that ha come from this uh, black influence and that only do happen here in the Iberian Peninsula. I will give you a an example that is close to you. You have the Sorchico rhythm in five uh, times. I'm singing in English because I think it is better because this is what jazz people do, my colleagues. Okay, I hope I'm not getting into a mess, but Francisco de Salinas in his uh, book, he was a blind musician that would work at the University of Salamanca. In my book, I analyze these five time uh, rhythms, and they say that it is a cultum, cantus exaltatu of the Spanish Mauritian people. Well, if you trace back folklore music at the time, then we start finding different links and some um, experts in music, they say that when you do a field study on folklore, some old rhythms that are based on five times, now 
they really is easier to do them in three times. Yes, one, two, three, one, two, three, rather than one, two, three, four, five. Because it's easier to count up to three only. So polyrhythm is explained in this uh, way. So you have the uh, different uh, odd numbers or even numbers to analyze even the most complex rhythms like in indie rhythms or in the Turkish music, well, in the Arabic world in general. So in, in the Iberian Peninsula, these uh, peculiar rhythms that are based on the addition of twos and threes that already the Arabs said that they could be a kind of light music that then are shared with the music and rhythm that we share with the black music. And I'm going to cut this short because I'm getting a bit into a mess. I'm not going, I'm not making this very clear. But I think that in all Iberian communities, we all share this uh, rhythmic uh, culture that links us to Africa and to the new world. Ladies and gentlemen. So we talk again about the muses. So in this field of uh, musical sound, that is an important art, underneath communities relate among themselves. Uh, with Irutruku, do you remember Irutruku, Joseba Tapia, and uh, Rupert Ordorica, and Vicente Martinez? Did you remember them? This was a fantastic band. I was with them once in Madrid. We were listening at what they were singing and realizing, realizing how the lyrics, very old uh, lyrics in Basque, also tell the stories that are told then in Portugal, in Mauritian uh, pieces of music. So these are like a musical cells that travel that uh, uh, were shifted through the Mauritians and the Christians. Uh, so this creates like a sound a mesh that sort of uh, creates the vertical uh, net or mesh of uh, these uh, languages and music. So we have something different to tell to the world here in the Iberian Peninsula that is different to the technification of the uh, business interest that is supported by the big labs that work uh, for the Pentagon or the other big uh, military weapons. The weapons we have for these uh, species to survive, to fight the battle of the spirits, resides there in this relationship in between these uh, uh, mesh, the different languages with their magical sound, and then the music that makes everything travel here and there. Time's up. <laughs> He's asking how you say time is up in Basque language, and that is am I to that? Iñaki, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Iñaki. Thank you to you for coming to Bilbao. He's been reading thoroughly my two books, and he gave me these keys that, in or these clues that, in a very short time, uh, allowed me to really share my message with you.
Can we get some spare 10 minutes for questions and answers? Come on, feel free, fire out, boys and girls, girls and boys. But, Dali, di... El micrófono. ¿Tienes micro? Sí, sí, sí. <coughs> Hola. A ver qué te pareció cuando le concedieron el... What do you think of when Dylan got the Nobel uh, Prize of Literature? Not much. I didn't think much, really. I don't think this was relevant to me. I was very much uh, a fan of uh, Bob Dylan for many years. Then I lost a faith at some point. When he visited the Pope, it was not really necessary, was it? Then, when he began doing standards like Frank Sinatra, well, I rather like Frank Sinatra himself. And then, I retrieved my faith when he did this kind of uh, last uh, Homer uh, chanting, there is this 17 uh, minutes uh, uh, piece of music as if he was uh, reciting Kennedy's uh, uh, killing with a very enigmatic uh, title, Mas Murder, Mast, Murder, Must Follow. And he's like playing Lyra. I mean, now killers uh, do not uh, remain hidden, like Putin, you know? He's walking on the red carpet and he approaches us, you know, as if he, it was the old empire. So, murder must fall. So he's idealizing, like Homer, the past of the American dream. Well, there were many uh, killings in the short time that put an end uh, to this American uh, dream, like the first Kennedy, the second Kennedy, Martin Luther King, then Malcolm X. So this idea that uh, murder mal must... Uh, most foul. This means like the paradigm of uh, the Western democracies would have a height, a foundational uh, default. So here he's going back to his essence, Dylan. Well, if they want to work him the Nobel Prize, too good for him. But I think that an electric uh, wanderer, um, popular on um, pop music, uh, and a dear colleague should not be expected to be awarded a Nobel uh, Prize or whether the Pope uh, calls him from a jam session. I don't think we should only give up on this romantic, uh, uh, you know, genius or because uh, the pop uh, music players still want to be this, uh, have this uh, special, you know, genius. But we, normal uh, rock players, we're not into that. So whether you get a Nobel Award or not is something that has nothing to do with me. If they tell me, well, Spotify, or the, uh, the voice uh, show, to me, this is like a parallel universe. Well, first of all, thank you because I come from Extremadura myself and my mother uh, would uh, sing uh, romance uh, music. 
And then you've been talking here about the uh, uh, Basque uh, free verse uh, singer, free verse singer. So this took me to the poetry and the rhythm of my mom. So this is really very important to feel it again and to leave aside, not technology, but to know where to use it and not on when not to use it. So I think what you have said uh, was really wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. And also thank you to Bilbao and to the Basque Country. Thank you for really hosting people from uh, all different uh, corners of the Iberian uh, Peninsula. I feel at home here and you coming from Extremadura, if you feel at home, that makes me really uh, happy. And when I see my Basque brothers having fun in Cadix, uh, I also like it a lot. I don't want to convince you about anything, but I think from a musical point of view, these alliances that we have here in the Iberian Peninsula is very, very important. Also preserving local traditions and its uh, purity and its essence with uh, its uh, essence. Uh, also, I mean, safeguarding ideas and all that. I think all this is very important. So you have to hold these two electricity wires, one in each hand. So this is this tension in between local and uh, foreign. Because I think this is how in the old Iberian Peninsula, the different communities, the Romans would say they are really crazy, these uh, Iberian uh, people. They are not uh, able to get together. They cannot create a federation, a confederation. They already learned about that uh, because they suffered first with uh, these uh, uh, soldiers. First, uh, the Centurions, and then we will get uh, the uh, Mountie, and uh, then go back to Rome. I mean, every unification is the fruit of an empire in the Iberian Peninsula through monarchies, through empires, through dictatorship. So this was always a unification that was imposed by a higher power. And the musical experience talks rather about different links and bonds that are not imposed, but it is just something that we do to preserve the essence, the natural essence of every uh, people. And also it's an addition of the strengths uh, in order to offer something to the world, something that the rest of the world doesn't have. We are, we are experts in the diversity, even through conflicts. These hard conflicts that we've been uh, living in the peninsula also I think there's been a lot of suffering, but this is an experience that is really worth a lot. It's worth the world. So this experience, sometimes a very painful one uh, through history, in these uh, 5,000 years of history, because there have been many conflicts among the different uh, uh, fights or conflicts in between the different Iberian uh, peoples. I think maybe if you're good to keep a certain tension, it is good. Like in a couple, if you keep a certain fight without, of course, uh, uh, fighting uh, with your hands, because that is about abusing, rather. Well, a lighter question, Santiago. I have been a fan forever since I see you dancing. Uh, and also since you did the Canto del Gallo. When did Radio Futura start doing a music that was not the same as the uh, music that was in fashion at the time, and then you start having these uh, lyrics that is are sort of uh, telling things rather than just, uh, let's go party. The first time I took a plane was when I came here to Bilbao. Can I say names and brands? 
Well, I stayed at the Ursula Hotel. It was the first time I took a plane in my life to do a playback here with my first band. I was studying the uh, philosophers and they said, come here and do playback. And I thought, oh my God, this is nonsense. So I was trying to get with it. I knew I would have to come to Bilbao and pretend I was performing or singing. So it was Emilia Manero, the, the first that organized the first encounter with Radio Futura. I will have to acknowledge uh, him this. And then the uh, ISP Box uh, well, Music Company, they wanted us to be a group of, uh, you know, a band uh, for uh, teenagers. But we were studying arts, we were studying philosophy, so we had our secret uh, also vices. So we we did not want to devote ourselves to fans, to our fans. But I really uh, cherish those, those days. But I said, OK, let's play the game. And uh, we survived. And we, the industry finally let us uh, be independent. We tried to do art. We used to try to turn pop music into arts. And uh, it was a hard battle. We suffered, but we got through it. And some people in this industry, they realized that they were kind of crazy. They don't want money. We just have to let them do. When we signed a contract with uh, Ariola and Jose Maria Camara, the late Jose Maria Camara, he said, you have to sign this contract. We uh, were the opening band for the Ramones. And there were like 5,000 uh, people watching us. And we were playing there as uh, opening band for the Ramones. And we uh, bumped into them at the Ramblas the day before. We were walking on the Ramblas, and they were sitting there uh, in a drugstore. And now there's a sex shop there, by the way. And they were all of them with their uh, fringes, same size fringe. And we so then, and we were so tough uh, looking at them, staring uh, at them, and we told them we're the opening band. We ended up uh, also in Madrid having something with them. So we're the opening band. And then somebody from Muse, Sony, uh, came and said, we want uh, to have a contract. We want a contract with you. And we told this guy, we're not going to sign anything else. We're not going to sign any more contracts. But he didn't mind. He said, well, to hell. We'll just do an oral agreement. You want some initial money to start going? And uh, we said, no. We don't want cash. Pay a studio for us for some months. And also, we don't have a very good... Uh, We don't have uh, a good amplifier. We're all using the same. So buy an amplifier for us. So that's how we got going. And we sold uh, 150,000 copies of uh, La Ley del Deseo and so on and so forth. So that allowed us be independent from an artistic point of view. Because sometimes, you know, The time in the 60s and 70s, rock and roll was a radical experimentation, but at the same time, they were selling well. But that was over. And nowadays, with internet and digital distribution, they have removed rock and roll from the industry. But rock and roll is still there. This is like blues music. It is dead. Whatever, you know? It is not that, it is all these that people talking through us. So when do lyrics start saying something else? When we realize that we can no longer have to run a double life in between a stage, the pop stage, and the private studio. 
but the private studio is beginning to provide us or to let us uh, put some content in our lyrics, in our music because the industry told us, what do you want to do? You want to be independent. They don't want cash. They don't want money. They want to be independence. independent. So they said, to hell with them. Let them be. Some other people wanted to say uh, the top uh, sellers. And uh, well, that's what Meccano did. Some others, they said, no, I want uh, to make everybody dance. Uh, I want to make uh, the uh, president of the United States dance. So they said the, they did the Macarena. So the music industry would let people do, would let them uh, go their way. Mr. Camara would say, this guy, he works in this way. And so we will sell records. And this allow us to be independent. And we, be able, we were able to uh, run this independent uh, career. But now we're out of the market. Now what only works is when you have many downloads on Spotify, you are not on the mainstream merchandising or product. Well, Spotify will uh, sort of kill, kill you. You know, you only get some cents. So the new bands, they cannot make a living with those cents. We, the old ones, were able to do gigs here and there, and that was very difficult, especially during the pandemic. But we were able to get going and to keep our challenge of experimentation. Now I wonder what's going to happen with the new generations if they don't do reggaeton, what is going to happen to them? Loss, you said. Yes, there's going to be a loss there. There is a loss of talent, energy, love, passion. How many new musicians are losing this possibility of making a living uh, with music if they don't do mainstream music? If they are not like this manipulated uh, kind of uh, music. We were also manipulated in the beginning. But this is why then we decided to get a side uh, way out. So lyrics became something that would share something meaningful when we realized we wanted to do our own thing and we were able to do it. Well, this is about Tate Santiago. We have to go. Agur, goodbye in Basque for all of you.